Salute to this Knicks Nation on this Sunday night. Another edition of Knicks Weekly. Special edition of Knicks Weekly presented by Manscaped. We are less than two weeks away from the NBA Draft. And our NBA Draft Q&A series continues. Tonight's guest returning to the show. A fan favorite. He's basketball skills trainer David Zenon in the building joining me and Al. So let's get right into it, man. We on a time crunch right now. We got to get to it and do our homework. Hit that thumbs up button for you boys. If you guys got questions for David tonight, call in ASAP 657-383-1509. Or you can hit us up on the Knicks Fan TV Discord. We got to talk draft and we're going to get into it right now. All right, salute to everybody in the chat. Once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. CP the Franchise, Al Sotaros, David Zenon in the building. Hope everybody's feeling good. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Let's get into it, man. David hit me up. He said, bro, listen, we got to talk draft. Obviously, I got my big board ready to go. So let's unveil the top 10 picks. Knicks have the number 11 pick. So right now, we're going to focus on 11. We're going to get into our sleepers. Let's get into David's top 10 big board for the Knicks. Number 10, we got Jeremy Sohan, the dynamic wing from Baylor. Number 9, Johnny Davis. A lot of people talk about the, the kid from the commercial. He's a, he's a Taco Bell guy, but but he's he's serious. Number 9, uh, Johnny Davis from, well, from Wisconsin. And we got Jalen Duran, the big man out of Memphis. Malachi Branham, or someone who's been rising on a lot of draft boards. We're going to talk about him. Number 7. Number 6, Mark Williams, the big man out of Duke. Number five, Ochai Akbaji, who worked out for the Knicks this past week. We're going to talk about him at length. Tari Eason, the wing out of LSU, coming in at number four. Number three, we got Dyson Daniels from the G League Ignite. Number two, Nikola Jovic. Not Jokic, Jovic. And uh, number one, A.J. Griffin. And uh, Dave, before we started the show, man, we uh, we, we talked about A.J. Griffin because of these guys. You, you know him quite well. The sharpshooter out of Duke. Someone who I, I hope falls to the Knicks at 11. But uh, talk about Griffin, man. Talk about what you like about young A.J. Griffin. Well, he's young. He's very young. He was the youngest player on the Duke starting five uh, by a couple months, actually. So he was a true freshman through and through. But he has prototypical size for an NBA win. <laughs> He's six foot six, 220 pounds, but he has a seven foot wingspan. And as we were talking about earlier, he's a sharpshooter. He was the guy for Duke as a catch and shoot guy. So every single time they had penetrating kick opportunities, double teams, he was the guy. And he worked his way into the lineup. Remember, in the beginning of the year, he wasn't getting a lot of minutes. He was kind of figuring himself out, figuring out the system. Coach was, you know, letting him earn that trust. So He's a kid that obviously has a high uh, basketball IQ, great pedigree. His father played in the league for a while. His two siblings both played high-level basketball, obviously, at UConn and Illinois, respectively. So he's, you know, he's my guy. I love him. I love his uh, pedigree. So I think that he's a guy that could help the team significantly. Absolutely, man. 45% from three, uh, standing at six foot six. He's a guy that could, that could play off for RJ and Julius quite seamlessly. Um, as someone who studies, you know, shot mechanics and things of that nature, as I said, the kid shot 45% from three. What do you see in his shooting ability, you know, that, that makes him so good, so efficient? He has a pure stroke. He has a pure stroke. I mean, he's been working on that. Uh, during the time, you know, everybody was in the pandemic, he spent a lot of time working out with his dad. Uh, down in Tampa when the Raptors were down there. So, you know, he had the ability to be around those guys and, you know, work out obviously with an NBA coach, as, you know, with your father. So that's that's a big help. That's a big yeah. benefit. But while he was down at Duke, he did a lot of stuff with his mechanics. He widened his base. I know it looked a bit unorthodox, but it actually helped him stay low to the ground so he could be able to beat his man off of the dribble just in case he was ran off of the three-point line. So that type of stuff goes a long way when you're looking at a player with his uh, stature you know he has a strong base so he's able to elevate on a shot he's a great athlete uh, people were making uh, a big deal about the fact that his first step wasn't as explosive as it used to be mm. I don't necessarily think that was the case you know he was just taking what the defense was giving him because obviously people realized the kid is shooting 45 percent from three mm -hmm. we got to be able to take him off of the dribble and uh, take away the catch and shoot opportunities. 
also, he didn't do a lot with the initial offense in terms of breaking down his man in terms of the ISO. He doesn't have, you know, the bag or he didn't show it. He has it, but he didn't need to show it too much. Obviously, when you're surrounded by those other four at Duke, he didn't necessarily need to do it, but he has it. Mm. So he shows, you know, excellent touch. He's able to finish at the rim. He's an underrated passer. He's just a, you know, overall IQ. I love the kid. Yeah, and, and one of the things, you know, in his workout against, uh, with the Blazers, he talked about, he said people are sleeping on his defense. What do you think about his ability to defend uh, at the next level? Yeah, just, just like what we mentioned earlier, the beginning of the year, he was kind of working his way into the speed of the game. I mean, although he was a McDonald's All-American, you, you can't replicate a high-level basketball. So the fact of the matter is he was, he was getting lost sometimes on defense. He was getting caught with those backdoor screens, but that also comes with studying film and getting the reps in with those first team guys, especially at a program like Duke where Coach K is going to be intricate in the game plan that he gives his players. It, it didn't shock me that, you know, he made the leaps and bounds that he did on the defensive end, you know, towards the end of the year. And then now with pre-draft workouts, you know, diet, he's going to have a nutritionist, you know, a chef, all that type of stuff. His, his body's going to be in tip top shape. He's going to be sharp. And of course, whatever team he's going to go to, the development program put in place is going to be, you know, high. Top so he needs to understand that that's going to be one of the first things brought to the table as a defensive uh, minded team for the Knicks. If they do select them, uh, that's going to be very important. And I, I know that he'll be up to the challenge for that. You know, another thing people feel like the early injuries that he, he suffered early in his, his career is going to hamper uh, his athleticism, his, his burst, um, you know, his vertical ability. What, what do you say about that? I don't think it will be too much of a hindrance for him. As I said, you know, he's getting his body in even better shape. I mean, he looked tremendous in that pre-draft workout that was circulating online. You know, he looked leaner. Uh, he was able to get his legs a little bit leaner. I'm sure that you know, they added some strength, they added some speed in terms of what he needed to do to showcase the skills that he had for the pre-draft workout. Now, the thing about his knee injuries, yes, that was a, you know, cause of concern for, for Duke fans first, but now, you know, whatever team's going to get him in the pros, I don't think that that's necessarily going to be an issue. Uh, he did, you know, it seems like he did lose some weight, but he's not putting as much stress on his lower body as he did in the past as, you know, a younger player who's a little bit more springy. As I said, that wider base has helped him uh, in terms of controlling his pace. He's going to get to his spots. He's not going to beat his man off of the dribble, but he's going to get to his spots by his pace. You know, the way that he's going to find his spots and be able to shoot over the defenders. And also, the let's not forget the fact that he can play uh, the two, the three, and he's strong enough to guard some fours. As I said, that base is very, very strong. So, I don't think it's going to be that too much of an issue, uh, if an issue at all. So I'm not too worried about that. Dave, how do you, how do you picture AJ Griffin playing alongside RJ Barrett? And uh, for what you've seen for the next, like we see RJ as a guy who likes to get downhill, and with AJ, obviously the shot's going to be there to open it up, hopefully for RJ. But what else? How else do you see these guys being dynamic as a one-two punch? Uh, well, I think that his rookie year or, you know, the initial time that he's with the NBA or whatever NBA team he's on, if the Knicks, for example, yeah, he will flourish with a guy like RJ who's able to penetrate and kick. Uh, the thing that intrigues me the most is how he can fit with that second unit as fast as they play. And RJ was able to get, you know, plugged in here and there with that second yeah. unit, which worked wonders. I mean, Obi's a great rim runner. Sims has shown that he has a tremendous ability to be a rim runner, you know, quick Grimes, who also those two guys can spread the floor as well, which alleviates any pressure that they're going to put on the front of the rim. So you're talking about two elite rim runners, one really great rebounder, and then two pure shooters in the corners and Grimes and Griffin. That's pretty good for a second yeah, unit. Right. And then if he does have to get plugged in with the first, uh, first group, uh, let's take him case uh, Julius Randle is able to get double teamed, he can kick out, you know, he's able to help spread the floor. And Fournier, you know, the minutes that they're going to have to balance with those two, as I said, AJ can play the three, you know, RJ has shown the ability to be a playmaker. So there's a lot of things you could do with him in the lineup that could help spread the floor. But then more importantly, he's a great playmaker as well. As I said, underrated passer, mm. you know, great with the dump offs and things like that. So 
I think he would be a great fit with the second unit, more so the first. But the more that he's able to play, he's the type of guy that's going to give you a solid, you know, when he finds his footing in the league, like, you know, 18 to 20 something points just off a catch and shoot one dribble pull ups, like just an efficient player. So that's how I could see he could fit with the team. Okay. And now you talked about his playmaking chops. Do you see him as being a someone that can initiate the offense, like share the workload with like Emmanuel quickly if, if need be? Like is that is that the type of playmaking you're talking about? Or just like if he's like the second option and, and like an action, then he can find somebody uh who's open out on the perimeter or in the paint. Well, the Knicks run a lot of DHO stuff. So, yeah. you know, the ability to cut, you know, in the slot and catch those backdoor opportunities for penetration and kick, you know, to to have any of those opportunities, Grimes can do it, which, you know, you could put AJ in the corner or AJ could lift from corner to wing or vice versa. And I'm not necessarily saying that he's going to break down anybody because that's not necessarily his game. Mm-hmm. What I say in terms of playmaking is that two dribble in which the big man has to rotate and you could throw it up for a lob or, you know, yeah. operating out of the pinch post in which he's a strong enough body where he could set up that DHO and then we were also to see that, you know, Obi could help in terms of alleviating some pressure on the front of the room as well. So that's the type of playmaking I'm talking about. I don't think he's going to break down his man and like, you know, you're going to give him the ball with a couple seconds left on the shot clock and like, hey, go at it. Not not for his first year in the league, but he could eventually turn into that kind of guy. But if you're talking immediate plug in role he's the type of guy that could flourish in a pick and roll opportunity. Remember he played with Mark Williams. So it was kind of just like, you know, throw it up there and the defense was collapsing on him. He never had to make that play, but with a spaced out floor in the NBA, if the opportunity arose and he needed to, I could totally see him doing that. That definitely a guy I would love to see fall. If he fell, we'd have an absolute steal at 11 and Hey, you never know if, if they happen to move up at seven, maybe this is, listen, this is, uh, Leon's target now uh, two wings who I think could be closer to the Knicks's wheelhouse at 11 you have Malachi Branham at Ohio State Johnny Davis out of Wisconsin you have Branham who finished the second half of the season quite efficiently he finished uh, averaging 17 points a game 53% from the field 43% from three 84% from the free throw line you have Davis who's also operates very well out of the mid-range defensive dog didn't shoot so efficiently at a high usage rate how do you see these two guys stacking up i love malachi like he was one of the guys that caught my eye with his second you know the second half of the year conference play he kind of you know was put on the map he's a he's a he's a chris middleton type of player well that's the type of upside i see for him you know, long arms, really good body. I'm, I mean, great vertical as well. So that's something that you have to keep in mind in terms of his his shooting ability. You know, yeah, he shot 41% from three, 83% from the free throw line, as you mentioned. So clearly you could tell he has a consistent shot and the type of offense that they were able to run at Ohio State showcased those abilities. He's a really good ball handler. Yeah. And that's the type of guy that when you asked the earlier question about playmaking, he can be that guy to break down his defender with a couple seconds left on the shot clock, you know, when when everything else is breaking loose. So he's the type of guy that you can feel comfortable with giving the ball and that opportunity. Great mid-range shooter. So, you know, a lot of people fall in love with the fact that he's a good three-point shooter, or excuse me, an, a great three-point shooter, but he's a really good mid-range shooter. He can stop on a dime. He can elevate over his defender. He likes to attack the top foot of his defender. So he's smart. His uh, his basketball acumen is is pretty up there. So he's not just going to try to create nothing from something. He likes to read the defense once they're in a half court set. That's what Ohio State did for a lot of the year with Zeb Key. You know, so that's the opportunities. Uh, those are the opportunities that he's going to give you a, a really good, solid playmaker that can uh, create, you know, off the dribble. You said Zed Key? Yeah, the big man, uh, Zed. Um, yeah, the, the big man from Ohio State gotcha. Center. You know, gotcha. He had a lot of attention on him. So, you know, yeah. that was the opportunity. How can he? How can this guy create off of double teams? How can this guy create off of cutting in the slot? Like all the things that, you know, the Knicks are going to, you know, see where teams did double team Julius or, did, you know, teams did push Julius out uh, more towards the wing and like, you know, had him create off of that 
what is this kid going to give the team pure shooting and the ability to, you know, if you run them off the three point line, that's cool. I could shoot a mid range jump shot. I can stop on a dime. I can create and the handles are strong enough in which I can go inside the paint and play amongst the trees. So as I said, he's the guy that I, I absolutely love his upside. And he reminds me of Chris Middleton. Good, good long body. With with, uh, with Davis, you know, a, a lot of people look at the, the high usage and, and inefficiency, didn't shoot it so well from three. Uh, but then there's a counter argument that says, well, he didn't really play with a talented supporting cast. He was relied on to, to really generate most of their offense. Um, again, had the ball in his hands a lot of times, took a lot of difficult shots, a lot of attention on him. H- how do you see it? His, and, and I think... His upside is like, he's a strong, heady guard. I mean, he put on a show in college basketball. I think that his thing is, he's aggressive in the way he plays. He's a great rebounder, really good rebounding guard. Uh, you know, the numbers that he put up at the combine were pretty impressive. His his ability to draw contact intrigues me. Uh, but, but, but yeah, I think him not having the supporting cast around him kind of hurt in, in terms of him showing more ability to play make. And, you know, he's not a point guard. I mean, he, he reminds me more of like a shooting guard that, you know, can play a little bit of point, but he won't be the answer that the Knicks need as a point guard. He can post up smaller guards. You know, he has a strong physical presence about him, but on the flip side, the mid range jump shot, you know, it kind of concerns me where teams are going to have him stop. Cause you know, once you have him stop in one area and the ball's dead, the play's dead, mm-hmm. you know, you got to kick out and then we restart uh, as, as a team, I should say, that's something that kind of caught my eye with him. And towards the end of the year, yeah, he did, he did get burnt out, but I think that's just because of the fact that there was no one else to alleviate the scoring output that he needed to have overall. He's a smart player, made massive improvements from his freshman and sophomore year which means that he's going to improve in the league with consistent player development. But if you're looking for a dude to just come in and plug in and play and, you know, fill in a role in the perimeter as a, you know, pure shooter or somebody that could help alleviate the pressure that Julius is going to face or RJ is going to face, he's not going to be that guy the first year, you know, and maybe even the second year. You're also looking at, you know, the other guys on the teams that are here, you know, Grimes has shown the ability to, you know, be the shooter that the team needs where it's going to be a shot clock. And he has a confident stroke. So how many shots he's going to face or get, excuse me, that's something that is kind of up in the air. I like him. He's going to be a very solid NBA player. But if you're looking for a guy to develop immediately here, uh, that's something that's up in the air. You see, so with like Malachi Brandon, what are some of the like his weaknesses that probably haven't gotten high because a lot of it you I mean you gave him the comp to Chris Middleton you talk about how he's got a good mid-range jumper he's able to attack uh the, the leading foot uh when guys are on defense and he can create his own shot with the shot clock winding down so what are some of the things that you think you would have to work on once he gets to the NBA level the thing I think he needs to work on is although he has a you know a really good mid-range jump shot uh he doesn't trust it sometimes in in, in certain spots And not necessarily that, you know, he's afraid of the moment, but more so just, you know, he does pick and choose his spots. He likes it a lot. So he has a tendency to settle for some shots because he's such a good mid-range shooter. I think he also thinks I could shoot over the top of the defense and we're going to see what happens. (laughs) But the Big Ten is totally different from the NBA, as everybody knows. So those guys are longer, more athletic, and they're going to study you. So they're going to know your tendencies and how you're going to get to your spots. So that's something I think he would need to work on. He's more, he's least efficient, and which is, which is interesting because as a right-hand shooter, you know, you set up with your left, you know, left-right into your one-two shot. So when guys are pushing him towards the lane and they're forcing him to drive, the ability to hit like a floater or the contested shot at the rim. He's not necessarily comfortable doing that, you know, with a taller, stronger defender on him. So that's just something I think he would need to work on significantly if he's in this in on the team. Okay. And, and for Johnny Davis, do you think him being the sole focal point of Wisconsin offense would be a hindrance for him coming to the NBA for someone like the Knicks, right? Because, 
we're the Knicks are probably going for somebody as you as you already pointed out, whether it's AJ Griffin, whether it's Brandon, someone who can play off ball and on ball. And we haven't really we haven't really seen that from Johnny Davis at Wisconsin. Do you think that would be a difficult transition for him coming to the NBA and saying if he did land on the Knicks? He he didn't he didn't have the opportunity to show a lot of pick and roll skill set, the ability. I mean, he was the guy. He did he did run, you know, they were able to do some stuff with him, you know, ATO action and things like that. Like his numbers were decent, but for the next level and like that pick and roll ability, you he'd have to show that he's gonna be able to create, use both hands and shoot over both shoulders. And you there's you can't post up a guard every single play. So that's something that he would have to, you know, be more comfortable, as I said, finishing amongst the trees. The the problem is his his aggressive nature, he's another one. He he might shoot these shots that he has no business taking. Um, and I think that was because of the fact that he didn't have another sidekick there. So maybe he's going to be smart enough to be like, you know what, I'm not feeling it or I don't have the angle or I don't have this or I'm trying to read my man drop coverage. There's a lot of things that are going to come into play in which he could just say, you know, what, RJ, you have it <laughs> like we we just don't know. So that that could be a hindrance where it's like, how well is he going to play next to a guy who. And although RJ made significant strides as a shooter this season, he's still not the knockdown three point shooter yet that you know you'd feel comfortable not sagging off like are you going to make sure that both of them are you know ran off of the three-point line and then who's going to alleviate the shooters in the corner you know that could be a question that you'd have to ask yourself if you're going to take johnny so to All everybody right. in the chat once again hit that thumbs up button for you boys Nick's draft q a with special guest david zidon i want to salute uh we got ari in the chat almighty finesse adele chapman how you doing jc jc the conqueror how's everybody feeling we are talking about some of the key guys uh on david's radar at number 11 uh we will take some calls and, and we're gonna get into a couple of sleepers so we're just moving through the program i see some people already on the line so just hang tight we know you have some questions and, and we'll certainly get to as many as we can um in the news today uh, or this week, rather, we had uh, Ochai Agbaji, the champion out of Kansas, senior wing out of Kansas, um, worked out for the Knicks. Uh, David, you, your thoughts on uh, on Agbaji? I like him a lot. Um, he's he, I would love for him to drop down to that to the eleven spot you know, based off of the workouts and different information, he's definitely going to be available in that spot. He's a taller version of the guy that is going to be physical Desmond Bain type, you know, great three point shooter, but he's six, six. He's very, very lean. Uh, he has a six ten wingspan. So he's kind of the opposite of Bain as Bain doesn't have a positive wingspan. He has kind yeah. of shorter arms, right. but his, his shoulders are broad. He's physically built, spent four years in college. You know, so he knows how to play the right way, knows how to do a lot of reads, <clears throat> excuse me, and his verticals through the roof, you know, at the combine, you know, two step, I believe it was like 43, 42 inch vertical for one, two step, mm. you know, so the, the kid's a tremendous athlete and just fresh off of a national championship. You saw the type of basketball this kid played yeah. all throughout like the him. tournament. And like the in conference the tournament. Play. He's going to find his spots. He's never going to rush. He's never going to let the defense determine what type of shot he's going to put up. He's just going to play the right way. And with the leaping ability he has, he's a decent rebounder. He took like close to like seven attempts, you know, from the three point line. But if you notice his tape, he does a great job at chasing his rebounds. Like he does, he mm -hmm. likes to follow a shot. He does a lot of things that are little subtle things that help a team win. So, you know, when you need that crucial offensive board, he's crashing. He's able to cut. You know, he does a lot of the things, and he's always ready for the shot. His hands are really, really good off the ball. And then um, anything that's off of a screen, you know, that type of action, it helped him being next to Christian Braun there. Uh, they, they, you know, were a good one-two punch in terms of both being shooters. But kid's a great athlete, man. I like him a lot. 
do, do you see that you know shot creation potential be being there at the at the next level or or do you see him maybe starting off as you know more of a you know catch and shoot and and a finisher uh, someone getting out in transition finishing tra- in transition um and things of that nature he's good he does a really good job you know with one dribble two dribble pull-ups little hezzy he like little subtle things he didn't break out that you know has he pull up a lot in college but a traditional pump fake rip through one two pull up that's his bread and butter like he he's gotten better at it which leads me to believe that four-year college player you know jumps up to 20 points per game you know range is able to consistently play uh, within a system where he doesn't need the ball to score He doesn't need the ball, you know, in his hands all the time to just create for himself. He could play off of a bunch of other guys. Kansas had, you know, a big man in McCormick who, you know, showed showed out in the NCAA tournament, but he was the primary factor still. So teams were just like, we're going to, you know, highlight this kid, but yet they still were able to, or he was still able to score because of the fact that he was letting everybody else feast and then he kind of picked them apart here and there. So I like his ability to do that. He's sneaky good with uh, being a playmaker as well, uh, but not necessarily going to be able to break anybody down, you know, from a full court, you know, aspect. Like he's not the ball handler that, you know, Malachi is. Mm. But if you, you know, held me to the fire and was like, what kind of player do you think you're going to get out of this kid? That's a kid you could plug in immediately. Like he could play immediately in the league. So what would you say your comp is like? What's a good comparison for like Agbaji, like so so that like the fans can get like a good idea? No, I, I think I, I think he's like a taller Desmond Bain. Like he's no, the type Desmond of Bain. guy that he's the type of guy that's gonna be off of the screens and then you know his feet are quick, like he's turning to the basket really quickly. He does a great job, you know, in horns action. Mm. He's the type of dude that you're gonna run off of a lot of screens quick three-point shot, good fluid form, consistent every single time. So six foot six, Desmond Bain is the type of player that I could see him being. And on the defensive end, he's smart as well. So he's going to be physical, you know, he's going to jam a lot of the guys, jam cutters, you know, he can move his feet, he can play or defend, excuse me, the two, you know, two, three, a little bit of the four. He's a little bit too lean to be the kind of guy that you're just going to have him guard somebody to duck him in. But if you're going to have a consistent guy who's going to, you know, be in the chest of uh, the two or the three or any wing, uh, that's the kid you would want. Do you see him being able to develop a game where he could take someone off the dribble and be a little bit more shifty going to the rack? Uh, that's tough because I don't see him ever being the type of guy to, you know, do three, four dribbles and break your man down. He could be the type of player that, as I said, the one – you know, pump fake one, two into a shot, you know, the most he can give you, I think is like, you know, a hard crossover, you know, kill dribble in and out cross, you know, type of, you know, attack to the basket, you know, because he's going to, excuse me, he's going to flourish with that mid range shot uh, because of the fact that nobody wants him to take three point shot because he's uh, such a good shooter. So I don't necessarily see him ever being the type of guy that's going to be three dribbles, four or five, you know, ISO, but one, two, or, you know, quick counter jab, step, rip through that type of player. I totally see him being that type. We're talking to David Zidon, basketball skills trainer on the latest edition of our Knicks draft Q and a, let's get those likes up. We got over eight, 900 people here in the chat. Let's get those likes up on this Sunday night. Another edition of Knicks fan TV live presented by manscaped fellas. Make sure you go to manscaped.com and to promo code KFTV for 20% off plus free shipping. It's heating up. Summertime is coming just eight, nine days away from summertime fellas. And like I told you guys last week, we're we're in we're in the Jordan mode. You know what I mean? Winter time we were on the Van Gundy tip. Nap pause. Now we're in the Jordan mode, fellas. So get right. Go ahead and go get your lawnmower 4.0. All those accessories. Manscaped.com. Promo code KFTV. 20% off plus free shipping. Okay, so Agbaji worked out for the Knicks this week. Another person who worked out for the Knicks uh wasn't this week, but um sometime this month. Uh, is Tari Eason. And, you know, last week I, I talked about 
uh, Tari Eason and, and what intrigued me about his skill set, David, is uh, just the ability to be a, a game wrecker on the defensive end and somebody who I think could help the Knicks offense in, in that way because we, we just weren't a, a defense that really specialized in takeaways, you know, in, in steals and, and block shots and getting out in transition, even though we have the pieces to do so, like RJ, OB quickly so on and so forth I mean you you saw that a little bit with Grimes you know his ability to get into the passing lanes and and be a disruptor obviously you saw that with with Mitch and his ability to to alter shots block shots but I see Eason in that mold on the on the wing as being the guy that can really propel our offense get us out in transition by being kind of a wrecker on the defensive end uh what do you think about Eason's game he is the type of guy that can guard one through three Uh, a little bit of four as well probably the most tenacious defender, you know, on ball kind of guy. He's versatile. He's athletic. You know, he's the type of kid that, you know, the term get it out of the mud wasn't ranked, you know, had a lot of, um, you know, he, he, he made a lot of strides in college. Now, offensively, you're, you're not going to get much from him, you know, from jump. He's a kind of a natural scorer. He finds ways to get buckets, yeah. but he's not, he doesn't do anything that's like consistently elite offensively. He's more instinctual. However, defensively, he's going to help if the Knicks take this kid, he's going to help them, you know, initiate those, um, those fast breaks. And, you know, he does a great job running the floor, but he's more of the shot blocker. He's going to be the one to initiate the turnovers, the steals, he has active hands. He does a great job with hands in the lane. Um, but as I said, he's instinctual, both offensively and, and defensively. Great rim runner, uh, but rim protector as well. So, you know, he he caught my eye uh, during the Kentucky game. And, you know, just the fact that, they, you know, he had a nasty, you know, just a nasty streak, you know. And, and LSU, unfortunately, as a program, was kind of in shambles last year. And, you know, you need leadership. You need somebody to hold, you know, hold things together. He was it, but he's the type of guy that's going to be like, you know, a Marquise, Marquise, Marcus Morris type, you know, nasty guy that could hit it a mid range jump shot if you need it. But his most important aspect or excuse me, attribute is going to be on the defensive end, but he can guard one through three. Uh, I have no doubt about it. Uh, stays in front of his man, does a great job communicating. Um, but yeah, he's a kid that has worked really hard to get to where he is. So I like him a lot. Do you buy that uh, his three point shot that's going to be solid? Because he shot on pretty well volume in college. I think looking at stats, he shot, he, he attempted 2.4 three pointers and averaged like 36, 37%. Do you think, do you buy that? Or do you think that's something that he's got to work on in the NBA? It, it's going to be something he has to work on because the, as much the volume, in which he shot sure all right i know you're confident <laughs> however are you consistent so you know you're confident that's great but you know a dead clock is right twice a day <laughs> like we need <laughs> we need you to be consistent in terms of your form uh your approach to the game you know how well you're going to be reading the de- you know the defender in front of you so i don't see it being like an anomaly where you know, yeah, putting up two threes a game, two point, you know, what'd you say, 2.2, something like that. So it's like, yeah, it, it, college game is totally different. You know, zones, you know, the way that they they have drop coverage, the floor is not as spread. He'll have more opportunities to shoot threes just because that's what, you know, the, the NBA is all about now. But I don't necessarily see him doing that that much. I could see him being the type of guy that, you know, if, you know, if there's a, you know, a ghost, a ghost screen opportunity or something where they can do, you know, pick and roll or, you know, the hammer in which he can, you know, slip to the basket and he's going to finish around that. It's either going to be strictly around the basket, the instinctual buckets that we're going to talk about, or, you know, catch and shoot in the wing threes or, you know, extended slot, you know, mid-range shots. I, I don't see him being much of a, you know, the type of guy to, facilitate anything on offense both with the ball or without the ball in his hand so that was that on on tari eason um dyson daniels he's a guy who's who's rising up on boards but a guy who you know based on taking the temperature of the fan base very polarizing 
player, very polarizing prospect. Some people don't see the promise. Some do. He's a guy who, who's, uh, you know, the 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 scouts and, and so on feel like is a, is a very versatile player, very multidimensional player. In, in your opinion, uh, what do you think is is his best skill set going in at the next level right now? He's a great. He's great at initiating a fast break. And he will find his man. He is an efficient player, great north south speed. Uh, you know, does a better job with the ball in his hand, obviously, and with running and, you know, creating the ball in transition, creating opportunities in transition. Uh, I'm, I'm a little leery about the fact that although his form is really good, uh, he sets his feet really well. He does, you know, all the things you want to do as a shooter. He doesn't necessarily take the shot that much. Like he wants to set up everybody else first. So it's kind of like getting to a point where you're like, okay, you can shoot that you're open or, you know, you don't, it's not as bad as like, it's not a Ben Simmons situation, but it's like, you could take that, you know, just because of the fact that, you know, a lot of teams in transition do put those shots up. That's fine. Um, he has a pretty good floater though. A uh, good touch around the basket, you know, so that might keep the defense honest, you know, has opportunities for him to, you know, as I said, penetrate and kick out of the transition, excuse me, find the trailer, that type of, you know, that type of stuff with the offense. But uh, the Knicks don't necessarily do that too much, but his ability to find guys, you know, and pick and roll uh, with whatever the situation may be at the center position, that could be helpful with the rest of the guys that they have on offense with, whether it's quick or Grimes uh, that helps spread the floor. He doesn't necessarily have to be uh, the primary playmaker. However, his uh, disposition, um, the way that he's able to control the floor, he's, he's going to be the primary playmaker on the team. Like, and, like I wholeheartedly believe in this type of uh, his skill set to be possibly the starting point guard. Like he is that type of player where he wants to establish the offense, establish the tempo, get everybody in their right spots first, which is something that the team needs. Uh, if you're going to be, you know, honest. So I think that he's a very intriguing player. He is a risk. Uh, you know, I'm, I'll just be transparent. He's a risk. Mm. And whether it's not because of the fact that he doesn't know how to play, but you don't need a player that's going to be timid in New York. That's you right. don't, you don't need a player that's going to, you know, self-check. Yeah. If the shot is open, you take it. If you have the opportunity to show your passing lane with the, you know, passing ability, excuse me, and get, you know, those opportunities for bigs to finish in a lane with either hand, he could do that. So it's just up to him where, you know, he's going to be able to put uh, other playmakers and, uh, excuse me, other players in the position of, you know, score. There, there were concerns about um, his shooting mechanics. How, how, how do you see it? And, and do you think it, it's something that he can improve on? His but his shooting mechanics were, you know, they were, they. I raised my eyebrows a little bit with them, mm. you know, because when I first saw him play uh, with the Ignite, mind you, he changed a lot with, you know, in terms of coming out of, uh, you know, a, a JUCO program. Like, that's not going to be consistent at first. Later, towards the end of the year, and then even some stuff during the, um, the, these pre-draft workouts, I've heard that the shot has become more consistent, but it's not the same um, – form every single time it's fluid he doesn't have a hitch but it's not the same form it's kind of you know his feet might be a little close he stands up when he shoots a little bit so it's kind of like a line drive shot with that so you know it's not something where he's able to change it immediately that's going to take a lot of work uh, but if you're the point guard and you know you're that tall and that big and you're able to be the playmaker that everybody says that you're supposed to be we're not going to look for you to score that much. Um, but it is something that's going to be interesting to see where teams are going to be like, all right, we'll give you that shot. You know, if you're going to self-check because you know your shot is not as consistent as it needs to be. Players aren't dumb. They know that. Mm. So that's something where he's going to have to fix uh, quick, fast, and in a hurry. So it sounds like Daniels is the type of guy that should go to a team that has – the, the capability to develop him, unlike someone like the Knicks who we're looking for at minimum a plug-and-play player. Is that right? 
Yeah, he's, you know, I think he could find, he, he would be fine with the Knicks. I'm not saying that he can't play with them. Uh, he'd, he'd actually be a really, really good player with the second unit more than the first, uh, just because yeah. this is not the type of player that, all right, Julius gets double teamed or, you know, the, the occasion that, you know, Mitch might have a high rebound and he kicks out for an offensive, uh, a kick out for a shot for an offensive rebound. Daniels is not just going to put it up. He's not just going to go catch a shoot. He could, he'll very much might swing the ball and then try to reset or, you know, who knows? It, would it be the right play? Yeah. Is it a heady play? Yeah. But that's not the NBA of today. <laughs> you know, they, they're looking for guys that are going to be able to fill it up from the perimeter. But I like his ability. I, I just find him to be intriguing. I like his ability to get into the lane. Um, you know, foot speed, north, south is great. East, west, he's not going to break his man down. Uh, as I said, over dribble. He has good handles, but he's not going to be the type of guy that's going to you know, the Kyrie effect, I guess you could say. So he can keep defenses honest with a, a really good runner floater game. Uh, but eventually they might drop to force him to shoot that jump shot. You know, we, let's see that 18 footer. You know, we know we don't want you to touch the paint so you can create for other teammates. We can just force you to one side of the floor and let you rock out and see if you could do it. So, yeah, the first year might be rough uh, for whatever, you know, wherever he may go. Uh, just on the sense of scoring, but being a playmaker and the actual point guard position within itself, I don't see him having any issue in the league. We're talking to David Zenon, NBA skills trainer. Hit that thumbs up button for your boys. This is Nick's draft Q and A with David Zenon, man. So tell everybody in the chat, we're creeping up on 1000 people in here. Let's go, man. A lot of draft hungry fans in here that want to talk hoops. Definitely appreciate everybody for tapping in. Uh, so we just keyed in on some of the guys who uh, we, we liked at, at number 11. Before we get into the sleepers, we're going to get to the phones right now, hear from the people, see what questions they have. Let's kick it off with my guy Sam on the Discord. Uh, Sam, how you feeling, man? I'm good. What's up, guys? Been a while. I'm yes, glad sir. to be back. Yes, sir. How you feeling, Sam? Let's go. Uh, Yeah, so I just, you know, I love A.J. Griffin. He's he's one of my top prospects that I, that I think would – that let me let me rephrase that i think has great potential and i really like him mm. my only problem is not with him mm. it's with the knicks okay we're looking at a team that that bottom five on catch and shoot threes mm. 22.7 attempts okay and we had shooters with rj uh quentin grimes and um uh evan fournier we had that option can AJ Griffin provide enough on the offense knowing that his catch and shoot is at that 45% level, despite the fact that we're at that bottom five? I I'd love to just hear your take on that. Well, Thanks, I think bottom five, let's be honest, not having D Rose for a majority of the year hurt them like, in, in all aspects, you know, whether it was transition, whether it was finding guys and pick and roll opportunities. You know, they they not they didn't have the floor general to set that type of stuff up, you know, and Alex Burks was more so the scorer that they had at the point guard position, which is something that that's why their catch and shoot opportunities were pretty low and no, no knock on him. I mean, that's he was asked to do his job. That's what he needed to do. If the Knicks are able to utilize quick you know, Deuce, I mean, let's not forget about him. Like, you know, and then D Rose coming back. If the Knicks are able to utilize those guys and more pick and roll opportunities or transition stuff, remember the opportunities they had to score in the second unit, they were faster. You know, yeah. the ball wasn't held on as much. And that's just because it's personnel. So Griff is going to be the type of kid that is going to run wide and deep. He's going to be able to find that shot that's open uh, in the slot position or in the corner, just like what he did at Duke. He barely took a lot of threes at the top of the key. I mean, he's not necessarily the type of guy that is going to take those shots off of screens, although he can do that, you know, a la the UNC game at UNC. That's, the, that's a player that could help you know, raise those numbers in terms of catch and shoot and having the confidence to, to help spread the floor. Also, if we want to be, you know, brutally honest too, 
Fournier wasn't part of that second unit. You know, Fournier, with the numbers that he put up, you know, there was, a, you know, big explosions. Uh, and, and then there were some times where he wasn't scoring the ball that much. Yeah. So, you know, if it's like feast or famine with one player who's supposed to be your pure shooter, that affects the rotations, that affects the rest of the offense in which they're going to set up their teammates. And I, I think that when you have Grimes on one end, Griff on the other end, and then whoever could be the playmaker or guy to penetrate and kick, Quick can do that, RJ can do that. So there, therein lies the, the issue that you have where you now have two pure shooters. And, you know, your initial point in terms of RJ being a shooter, he wasn't. His numbers went up. Don't get me wrong. He did a great job improving his jump shot. He, you know, shot really well from three, really, really well from three. But he's not the shooter that Griff is walking into the league. You know, if you said R.J. Barrett and Griff as a shooter walking into the NBA, they're not the same. This kid is an actual pure shooter. Like, this is what he is made to do. So he's going to help spread the defense. You could put one guy in the corner. You could put one guy in the wing. One could lift, one could run baseline, and it forces low man to rotate or make a decision which he wants to, you know, come up and run him off the, the line. And that creates opportunities for cutters and all those, you know, the softest part of the, the defense, the middle of the paint. Totally yes. different situation when you have two of them instead of just one of them. So I get it. Mm -hmm. um, I could understand the, the concern, but he could help spread the floor even more. So uh, great, great question, though, man. Pre appreciate yeah. it, Sam. Love it. Okay, Pre yeah. Appreciate it, man. Just, just going to keep it rolling because uh, we, we press for time. So to the phones we go. Area code 917250. What's your name? Where are you calling in from? Hey, what's going on, fellas? Uh, Omar from the Bronx. CP Alex, how's what's going Omar, on? Omar, what's good, my uh, dude? David, what's listen. Up? That, that, thank you, David. Thanks for coming on the show, man. We appreciate it. I've been saving this question for the right me, guess, man. and you, you're the perfect guy to ask the question to. Um, so it's a two-parter, David. So first thing, how much of a role does the type of player development play in the success of play in the success of failure of these kids? Like, because Tib says that there's the film room, there's practice, etc. So do you think that the kids need to actually play on the court like in order to be developed? And then tying into that, do you think sometimes coaches try to turn the player into what they want or need them to be like in their system rather than acclimating the system to what the player's you know, skills are? And maybe that's why some of these kids are not reaching their potential. Good question. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's a great uh, two-part question. So, yeah, first and foremost, you got to study a lot of film. You get your reps in practice. Obviously, that determines whether you play or not and how the coaches uh, align you up with whatever matchups they may have for that game. You know, I think that's the type of work that needs to be put in. Yes, their development staff lines everything up for the, for the player to succeed, or, or should be at least. So... To answer the second question, unless you are a top five pick in which you are there, you know, you're drafted to basically save the franchise or to, you know, be the man from jump. No, teams aren't going to necessarily change uh, their developmental philosophies or offense or the way they're going to set things up for you because, you know, you have to learn the ropes. You have to, you know, learn the speed of the game and you know, even some some guys who are, you know, top three picks have to go through that as well. I mean, RJ is a good example of that. You know, the skill set that he had, the, the Knicks looked at it and said, this kid is phenomenal at finishing at the basket. And then they slowly but surely, you know, created more opportunities for him away from the rim because he put in the work to fix his shot. Uh, so that's, you know, th that's basically, you know, based on the personnel that you have and what the teams are facing in the matchup. But yes. Player development is huge for the players first. Watch your film, get your reps in practice. And by the time training camp is over, coaches have a good idea as to what they're rocking with. Area code 929. Thanks, Omar. 929, what's your name? Where are you calling in from? Yo, this, yo me right here? Yep, yep. Yeah, Jay from Stand Out. What's up, bro? Jay, what's good, bro? How you feeling? I'm good. Um, yo, I was, first of all, I want to take back me calling Dyson Daniels Dante X 2.0. <laughs> that boy nice. <laughs> that boy nice. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna take that back. You know, I'm gonna take that back on record. All right, but no my question is, um, my question is, um, 
I I personally think I think the Knicks should go after Ty Ty Washington. Maybe I have my Kentucky mm-hmm. ones on. I'm a big time Kentucky fan, mm-hmm. but I feel like I just I just feel like his penetration to the lane, all that stuff, can really help out this team. I think he's a good mid range shooter. I think he's a good three point shooter. I think he could fit in with um quickly because quickly is a combo guard. That's how I view him as. And then you got Ty Ty Washington. He can, I think he's a pure point guard, but I feel like he can play off ball as well. He showed that in Kentucky as well. So I don't know, but um, I want to see what y'all, what y'all think about that. Dave, your, your thoughts on Ty Ty Washington. That that might have drawn some tomatoes in the chat, but what, what's your takes on Ty Ty? See, Ty Ty is a really good player, uh, but Ty Ty is not, you know, a lottery pick. Uh, in my eyes, I – I love, I like Ty Ty a lot. Um, I got to watch him a lot, obviously, uh, because of the fact that I watched Jacob Toppin, uh, you know, consistently, <laughs> but to see the the type of playmaker he is, yes. Uh, you know, the caller hit it on the head. He's able to penetrate, does a really good job, you know, good mid range shooter. I can't necessarily say that he's, you know, the, the knockdown three point shooter in the league yet, you know, he's, he, he has a good body, uh, but smaller build. Um, so I think guys are going to be a little bit more physical with him to the point where he's not just going to create a lot off of the, the perimeter for his shot, for his three-point shot. Uh, I, the other issue I saw, though, at Kentucky was the, the lack of shooters. You know, their, their best shooter got hurt uh, in midway through the year. And, you know, Davion Mintz was next up. And, you know, Kellen Grady, excuse me, he was the best shooter that they had, uh, but he was pretty much the only shooter that they had. So outside of Ty Ty. So, you know, with the injuries that occurred and sharing the ball with severe Wheeler, I didn't get enough feel for him to say, you know, I would take him as a lottery pick. Is he a first rounder? Of course. Like he's a top 20 pick in my eyes, but if you're up at 11 or even if they, the, you know, the Knicks trade up, uh, I wouldn't necessarily take him at that spot, but definitely a first round pick. Area code 352. What's your name and where you calling in from? 352, 352. Oh, you CP, it. CP, you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, man. You almost missed your calling, man. We were going rapid fire through the calls, <laughs> man. You got to be ready. Mm-hmm. No, it's all good. I'm, I apologize. All good. How's everybody doing? Good, man. What's your name I, where I you calling in question. from? Um, d- how do you guys feel, one, about you know, moving back in the draft, but two, mm-hmm. going after like Anthony Simons, who's a restricted free agent. And, you know, I think that he, he would, he would be good. And even if we went after him outright or traded for him, yeah, I think that it's a possibility. I think that he would be good for us, especially if we sent Randall over there, but, you know, and then possibly, you know, draft a big man or, or somebody, you know, some other shooters to help, yeah, well, pre- appreciate then, the, appreciate you know, the, the call, other- man. I, I mean, look, I think uh, the Knicks have shown that they're willing to trade back. They they've done it in both drafts since under this Leon regime, and and with uh, with Walt Perrin in tow, a guy who you know wants to uncover every stone and evaluate all these players when they're comfortable with a guy that they like, they they be willing to trade back. You look at Charlotte, who has a thirteenth to fifteenth pick, um, certainly possible, C- certainly possible. As far as Anthony Simons, I mean, I would have to think that the Blazers are intent on, on trying to keep him. They, they're trying to load up and give Dame all the talent that he can get because they, they're trying to build a contender. I don't, I don't see them doing it, but they're trying to build yeah, a contender. Yeah, even if they're trying Dame. to surround Dame with that type of talent, that's a kid you build around for the future. Yeah, no, no he, question. That boy's tough. Yeah. So uh, that, that'll, that'll be, you know, they're going to give up the farm for that one. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'd have to trade a whole lot to get Anthony Simons. It's yeah. not, it, it's, you're going down the wrong path. We're just going to be blowing up the entire Knicks squad just to get Anthony Simons. And then we're figuring out, oh, how do we build around this guy? <laughs> just blowing up the entire team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shout out my guy Fritz Alcindor in the chat. Since a fight out super chat, he says, what about trading back for Wendell Moore, David? Wendell Moore. Oof. You're, you're putting my Duke allegiance to the test with this one. Uh, <laughs> The, I like Wendell Moore a lot, um, but he is, I mean, he might fall into the second round. He did a great job improving his, his shooting. Um, I believe he's a first-round pick. Mm. However, with the rest of 
the draft and how guys or what the needs are these teams or for these teams. You know, he's a six six slasher, uh, showed the ability to, you know, hit the three ball, but his explosive play and, you know, he was a Swiss Army knife for Duke. He's a great player, um, but he's not in the top 20 in my eyes. I mean, I wouldn't want to see the Knicks, you know, draft or excuse me, trade to, you know, get more picks later on in the first round if it ended up being past the 20th pick. <laughs> That's something that I feel as if it's kind of counterproductive. You know, you're either going to trade up or you try to do what Charlotte has where you have two picks within, you know, those first two 15 picks. So I don't see him in that realm. Uh, I could see him falling to the second round, unfortunately. But he would be good if, you know, he's available second round, like later on, like for a trade, you know, that that would be something that I would like a lot because that's a really good defender. That's a guy that could help spread the floor a little bit. Uh, playmaking ability is is really, really good. I just think that, you know, the shot is a little slow. Uh, I didn't see anything that was like consistency, consistency, consistently, excuse me, elite with him. Uh, on the offensive end um, that, you know, caught my eye to be like, all right, he's going to be an explosive NBA player. He's going to be solid. He's going to be good, but not explosive. Talking to David Zidon, basketball skills trainer. Salute to everybody in the chat once again. Knicks draft, NBA draft 2022 Q&A. Hit that thumbs up button for you, boys. We're doing a deep dive in this thing, man, with the people who study this thing for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, man. You're not getting this anywhere else. This is quality, quality content. Uh, we, we're doing our homework here, ladies and gentlemen. We're doing our homework. We, we talked in depth with the number 11 pick. Now, the Knicks also have a second round pick at number 41. So let's talk sleepers here. Uh, let's start with J.D. Davidson, man. Point guard out of Alabama. He's a guy that's on your radar as a, as a sleeper pick at 41. What, what do you like about J.D.? One of the best athletes in the draft. This kid is a tremendous athlete, bounces crazy, is very, very explosive, you know, is able to uh, be a one-man fast break. Like, he's Kira Lewis with, like, a plus 40-inch vertical. Like, he just super, super fast. Um, he has a lot of moves. Um, you know, he can break down his man. The, the only issue that I have with him is, you know, the shot. It's, it needs a lot of work. Mm. Uh, the, you know, the jump shot needs a lot of work. But, you know, full speed ahead, man, this kid, once he grabs a rebound or he's able to get the outlet, he's off to the races. Uh, because of the fact that he can jump so high and he's so athletic, he can finish over bigs uh, pretty well. But finishing through the contact – that's something he needs to improve on just because of the fact that I think he's so used to beating guys off of the dribble. Like he's lightning quick that he didn't necessarily need to do that too much until he got to college. Uh, can he finish? Yes, he can. I'm not saying that he can't just something that he needs to work on, but most importantly, that outside shot has to improve, it has to improve. I mean, he, he turned the ball over a lot as well. So if a team is going to see the fact that you, you know, you're, you're turnover prone and you can't hit an outside jump shot. That's kind of tough as a point guard yeah. <laughs> uh, at, at any level. And that's the, the issue that Alabama ran into with him. So lightning in a bottle, you know, you know, this could be either feast or famine with mm. this pick, but he's a sleeper in my eyes just because of the fact that he's young. You could help change the shot. You could fix it, but you can't, you can't necessarily teach what he already knows, which is instinctual basketball. Mm. He's just a hooper. So uh, as I said, feast or famine, yes, you're going to get a lot of flashy plays. You're going to get a lot of jaw dropping passes, but then you're also going to get a lot of hair pulling, you know, turnovers Decisions. where you're like, yeah. what yeah. were you doing? Yeah. But the upside is there. I think that he is in my eyes, you know, a top five athlete in this draft and it's someone to, you know, worth looking at. How about Ryan Rollins on your list, guard out of Toledo? This kid is the one that if he miraculously, I think he, I think the more that he showcases his abilities in these workouts, he's going to go in the first. Mm. Um, but if the Knicks do drop in the first or he somehow slips to them in the second, like you have to take this kid. Um, 
He has a really good body. I mean, he's six foot. I think he's like six, three, six, four, you know, 185 pounds in that range. However, he's smooth, man. Like, and, and I get it, you know, mid, you know, mid major point guards are kind of the wave right now. You know, sometimes you're like, I'm falling in love with, you know, it's the John Moran effect, Dame type, you know, effect where it's tough, hard nosed kid from a mid major program. But when I tell you the kid, his, his, his uh, handling skills are incredible and he's smooth. He gets to his spots. He's always, he's always a threat to get a triple double because he does attack, you know, the glass. Um, he's a really good rebounding guard, you know, to get to the paint and like to create contact. He's pretty good. Um, decent at the free throw line, you know, had, you know, a good amount of attempts because of that. But for some reason, I just get this feeling that at the next level, because the floor is, you know, wider, there's more spacing that Ryan Rollins is going to be, you know, explosive mm. and he's going to be able to find his guys. He has elite court vision and he's smooth. He gets to a spot. So he doesn't necessarily have to score immediately, but he will score and get, you know, he takes what the defense gives him. I think the fact that he played mid major might hurt him. So he falls later in the first slips into the second, you know, Toledo wasn't necessarily, or isn't like, you know, traditionally like the mid major programs, like the Murray States where they, they kick out, you know, an elite guard mm -hmm. every year in per se. So it's like, you're looking at how these guys are lining up with the guys that are in front of him. Um, assist numbers, although he didn't put up a lot of um, assists, the way that he got his guys open, they were, they were draw dropping quality. Like he has a really, really, uh, you know, great flair for the game. So I like him a lot, man. I just get this weird feeling about him. He reminds me like of not, not exactly like Halliburton, but like the type of, you know, he doesn't jump off the screen in which the sense of, if I look at the numbers, oh, four assists per game, that's not a point guard. Well, what, what was the surrounding talent around him? You know, what are you going to give him? And at the next level where the floor is more spaced, uh, spaced out and you're going to have guys that are elite finishers and RJ and then we talk about shooting, you know, confident, quick, a confident Grimes, pick and roll threats, rim runner threats with Obi. I, I don't know. I just I just think that he's one of those guys that's a good sleeper. He's something to look at. There's a guy that that I find kind of intriguing. That's Orlando Robinson, the big man or, or kind of versatile, you know, seven footer, very versatile inside and outside uh, from uh, Fresno State. So the, the thing about him is he probably has the best footwork back to the basket skills for anybody in the draft. Mm. And the, the, you know, the knock about him was, or is, excuse me, is the feet don't move that fast on defense. Well, they move pretty good on offense. Um, he's, mm. he's able to like really utilize his, you know, his pivot foot, you know, over both shoulders, like, He's a really good back to the basket player. Um, the thing about him that I kind of worry about putting the ball on the floor too much. You know, I didn't see or I haven't seen anything where, you know, passing out of double teams, you know, sure, you can have tremendous footwork and sure you're able to score and, you know, do the things around the basket. But, mm -hmm. you know, that that dribble where the help side comes over and they're going to double you because they see like you are a problem one on one how well are you able to kick out or, you know, can you make that skip pass, you know, that, that what, you know, a lot of people can't do what Jokic does, but similar to that, you know, mm -hmm, are you mm -hmm. able to find guys on the opposite side of the floor in which you're able to create for your teammate? That's something that I would like to see him do at the next level, or if he can do at the next level, but personnel wise, the rest of the team, that's not the guy that you're going to put in the second unit. Like he's not running with those boys. Mm. And if he is, he's going to establish the offense at the top of the key. And, you know, they're going to have to slow a lot of things down. So overall, like if it's something where they're going to take a flyer in the second round, sure, why not? You know, yeah. with the uncertainty of um, Mitch coming back and then also, you know, you don't know what the plans are with New Orleans or Taj. Like that's a good backup plan. You know, that's yeah. a good center where it's like you could set up the offense and 
you know, hopefully they're able to create something out uh, as a half court set. Does the three point shot have potential? You know, the percentages improved each each year, but is he a guy that you know may give you like one or two in a game, or is he a guy that you know could could potentially be be a, a stretch five? You know, maybe off the bench. No, I think he could. I think he could be like a stretch five. Like he's like um not as physically as imposing, but remember, like Aaron Baines made that that transition. Yeah. Where you're just a big body dude, set a really good screen. Because remember, that's that's a lost art too. You know, setting a proper screen. No question. But then also like, how do you set your screen? Are you you know you are you setting your screen to roll to the basket? Or are you setting your screen to seal off the defender and like also you know bury whoever else? Like he's a good, heady player that could help you do pick and pop, or mm. Slightly do a ghost screen. He's not quick enough per se to kind of do that, or like you know to to rub off uh, his man. But I could see him being like that type of player, like an Aaron Baines type, to kind of get the floor spread mm. if he does improve his three. Do I see him being like you know a type of guy that's going to put up like three threes a game? No. Yeah. But once in a while it doesn't hurt, especially with you know the type of plays that they're going to run with the the DHOs. Um, they do run a form of a triangle per se. So it doesn't hurt, you know, if he is available later on in the draft. And last on the second round sleepers, you got Keeve Aluma, senior forward out of Virginia Tech, 15 and six last year on the campaign, shot 53% from the field, 35%, no, 33% from downtown, 35% in his, in his uh, junior year. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on Keeve? So I, I was very interested in this kid because I saw him play at Virginia Tech two years ago. And, you know, the footwork caught my eye. Um, he wasn't necessarily super skilled. And uh, history-wise, I tweeted about him when he was testing the waters last year. I was like, you know, he's going to come back and he's going to make some strides. I like him a lot. So six foot nine, he's a legit six nine. Um, and he was causing fits for Duke in the ACC tournament for everybody. UNC, mm. you know, he, he did wonders against Armando Bacot and, you know, obviously the bigs at Duke. He is really good in the low post, but he's not going to stay in the low post. He's the type of guy that you could pass it to him in the post. He'll kick out, then rescreen, open up with a short corner jump shot, whether it's like from the dunker spot or whether it's from the elbow. Mm. He's the type of guy that's going to keep the defense on its toes just because he could play off of uh, or go over either shoulder. So he's a decent scorer off the dribble as well. So, yes, if he is able to come up and set that high screen, you know, from the slot, from the elbow, from the wing extended, he is capable of putting the ball on the floor more than once and not just holding on to it and killing the offense. He could attack the basket. He's a decent shooter for a big man. Um, the reason why he doesn't, necessarily jump off uh, the screen is because he's not a crazy athlete like he's not out here dunking on people he's not you know getting the, you know these crazy boards mm -hmm. he, he leaves more to be desired on that end of uh, the spectrum uh, in terms of being a rebounder but he's a he's a decent playmaker decent defender uh, more of a rim runner I mean excuse me rim defender than he is just an on ball blocky down type of guy uh, shot blocking ability, as I said, the rim runner, uh, rim protection is really, really good. Uh, the thing I would like to see him do or improve on, obviously, is long range shooting. Um, you, you know, you're a good mid range shooter, and you know, uh, supposedly the mid range is dead in the NBA. Yeah, right. But yeah, okay. But this kid is a really good mid range shooter. I would like to see the same type of, you know, footwork being applied to his three-point shot, you know, staying low, same shot pocket. Because of his personality on offense in which he is mostly that low post score, he's not overly aggressive from the perimeter. Uh, but if he's able to get two dribbles, some contact, go over the shoulder, quick little um, jump hook action, love it. He needs to improve his footwork on the defensive end, on ball, you know, quicker defenders can kind of get by him. Drop coverage he needs to improve on. And because of the fact that, you know, he lacks athleticism, you know, that's a project. I'm not – he's not the type of kid that I'm going to say, 
he's going to play with the main guys for the whole year. He's going to spend time in Westchester. Mm. No doubt about it. Like he's definitely going to be in Westchester for a year or two. But if you want to back up four down the road or even a stretch five based on the way the NBA is nowadays, you're talking about a year or two from now that the, the Knicks can stow away. He's a really good pick to have, in my opinion, because he's going to be a solid, solid player once he's able to catch up with everybody else in the league. Interesting, interesting indeed. And we're talking to David Zenon, basketball skills trainer, Knicks draft Q&A, man. Great show, great show. Uh, two more quick ones before we let you go, man. The Jalen Williams hive is erupting in the chat right now. They're about to have a revolt if we do not talk about Jalen Williams. And they're like, how do you not have Jalen Williams on your on your draft board? Well, David did hit me after we made the graphic. He was like, yo, we got to have Jalen Williams in there. I was like, well, <laughs> we're going to go with what we have, but we'll talk about him. We will definitely talk about Jalen Williams because he is on your list. So, uh, yeah, let's let's talk about it, man. Yeah, man, he is. Like, I watched a bunch of tape for the show and just in general. Like, I <laughs> watch a bunch. Of, so, Santa Clara, you're like, I don't watch a lot of Santa Clara games, but – when it comes to just evaluating guys who have good numbers, you know, this kid popped popped up and offensive, um, you're talking about six foot six, solid body. I think he's like 215, 220 in that range. Like he has a really good body, pro body. His offensive creation, I, I gotta tell you guys, and the Jalen William Hive, shout out to you guys for 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 that. He's efficient in terms of creating for everybody else. And that's how he gets his shots. I mean, I've seen this kid make some passes, you know, from going baseline or even skip passes with his offhand that caught my eye. High level three, you know, three level score from the pick and roll. Like that's the type of player that is gonna feast in the NBA. Um, I watched some interviews, very articulate, um, intelligent, understands what he needs to do. He was talking about, which caught my eye, or excuse me, which yeah, I caught my eye, is he was talking about the fact that a lot of teams were giving him the slot cut because of the fact that he did a lot of off-ball stuff off the DHO. Mm. And immediately I was like, most players that have the ability to be the man and the strides that he made in terms of improving every year wouldn't necessarily take uh, the opportunity to say, yeah, I gave up the ball and then just got it right back. Like, mm. I'm not looking for the shot every single time, but somehow the ball lands in his hands. So mm. anyway, he's the playmaker that is going to be the guy that could break down his man from the perimeter. Yes, he needs to improve on some stuff with his handles. Um, but in, in terms of initiating contact, you know, he uses his chest um, or excuse me, his shoulders to kind of get into the defender's chest to finish on the short corner jump shots. I like him a lot with that. He's going to find guys. He's not a point guard, obviously, but if he needs to, he's not going to be selfish. He's not going to put up bad shots. Finishing those shots, however, in the um, towards the rim, mm. yes, he's going to have to improve on that uh, just because of the fact that those guys are bigger and stronger. I mean, yes, the West Coast Conference had Gonzaga and San Francisco, uh, St. Mary's. After that, big drop off. Mm. So you're like, what is the consistency with what he's going to go uh, go with in the next level? But yeah, yeah, I like I like him a lot. He's a he's definitely a sleeper. He's a first round pick. Um, you know, if that's a guy that you know is like the 15th pick, in which what guys are trying to do with swapping the two picks or you know 18th, whatever, he's going to be there. He, I think the fact that he doesn't have to carry as much of a load on offense is going to actually help his game out a lot just because his personality is not like I have to put up every shot every single time. So having a player uh, alongside him and, and he might, I don't know. I mean, he's the type of player that's going to be sneaky good enough to kind of crack a, a starting rotation after a year, just because he's heady and he's going to make the right play. So I would like to see him do more with his feet defensively. I was going to ask that um, that's next. That's a big, big, big question mark. Um, he he gets overly aggressive with his closeouts. Uh, kind of, he gets caught flat-footed a lot. Like he gives up more line drives than he does being broken down. Mm. Um, 
you know, if he's able to catch up with this guy and like move his feet, he's able to use his hips, use his chest to be with his defender. He does a great job jumping vertically uh, in terms of contesting shots. The problem with that, though, on the flip side is he turns into a jumping jack with pump fakes. So he gets caught with a lot of those, you know, pump fake and ones finish at the rim. He doesn't foul, you know, he doesn't foul guys hard enough to kind of stop the play as well. Um, But he'll learn that. I think, you know, the more you play within this league and understand the nuances of, you know, how you're going to stop defenders, um, excuse me, the guys on offensive end as a defender, that's going to go a long way with him because physically he's ready. Uh, I just think that on the defensive end of the floor, he's going to have to improve a bit. Interesting indeed, man. Well, a lot to lot to think about, a lot to digest as as we creep up on this draft. But uh, certainly excited to see what what Leon and and Scott Perry, Will Perrin, and these guys come up with, man. Great job, great show as usual, man. Definitely value all of all of your insights on this thing, man, because we, we know that you, you you study these guys extensively, work with these guys extensively. Um, before you go. A guy that you did work with and have been working with and, and you know, really, really came on strong, especially to close the season, is Obi, man. It, it is Obi. Uh, what do you think Obi's going to be working on this offseason? Man, I don't know. He's been working. I mean, he works out a lot with the, the Knicks staff, which is really encouraging. Like, that's something that he's, you know, he's trying to improve that three-point shot trying to improve the playmaking ability, you know, do all that type of stuff. Like he showcased his ability quite well towards the end of the year, you know, given, uh, given the opportunity and circumstances. I just think um, when you look at a player like that, you know, he's high energy all the time. Like he showed um, more on the off uh, on the offensive end, obviously, but yeah, I think he he's going to work on exactly what he was talking about with a quick, you know, mm-hmm being more uh, creative off the dribble, you know, improving that three, that perimeter shot, you know, he showed that he's a willing passer and, you know, made some tremendous passes. Some of them didn't fall. Some of them did, but man, he's, he's a great player, man. Complete package. In my opinion, um, did pretty well on the defensive end too. proved a lot of people wrong on that end. So I think, yeah, the outside shot and creating more. So, I mean, he's going into year three, that's the year you got to make the leap, big one, yeah. quote unquote. So I, I'm excited for for what uh, what Obi's going to look like when he comes back. It's a big one indeed, man. And I just feel like, you know, everything you said came about with his confidence. And as he said himself, uh, the confidence came with uh, playing time and, you know, not looking over his shoulders. So, again, it's going to be very interesting to see how they handle this rotation and his playing time going forward. But uh, very encouraging to, to see how he finished the year, man. So... Anyway, uh, great great show again, my guy. Safe travels back. Uh, we, we might have to bring you back for another deep dive before the draft, man. So let me know your schedule. And, and yeah, because we got a lot more questions. A lot of people got more questions. Talk about Jovic and, and all these guys. So but let's figure out. We might have to do a part two before before the draft kicks off, man. So, so we'll definitely, um, I'll hit you up and, and we'll schedule it. Sounds good, my man. All right, sounds good, man. Thanks again. David Zidon, ladies and gentlemen, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. Uh, drop your Twitter for, for the people in the chat so that, uh, that they, they can follow you. Uh, it's Dave Zenon. Pretty simple. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just, I keep it, I keep it simple. As simple yeah. as possible. Just uh, D-A-V-E-Z-E-N-O-N. Dave Zenon. There you the go. There. there you go, man. Thanks again, bro. Appreciate you, man. All right, salute to everybody in the chat. Once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. Who else does it like Knicks Fan TV, man? We bring you the best of the best who cover this draft. Like I told you guys, man, we want the guys that study this thing day in, day out, night in, night out. And uh, Dave is one of the best, man. Always comes back and drops a ton of gems. Ari in the chat said, I can't believe how much this guy knows about every single one of these prospects. And yeah, man, Dave Dave is definitely a beast. So we we definitely appreciate him for his time. And thanks for everybody else for tuning in. Wait, Ari said something nice about me? Yeah, he did. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he did, man. He did. Ari Ari was was complimentary, man. You know, he he took a break from breathing fire in Twitter and and in the chat. So uh, shout out to Ari, man. He was rocking with us the whole show. Shout out TM, JJ as well. 
Um, real quick, fellas, you know, M NBA Finals are, are tied up now to a piece. We saw the chef go off in chef-like ways in Boston, man, giving Boston Brilliant something to think about. Um, Al, where do, where, do, where do you see this thing going, man? I'm sticking with seven, man. Yeah. So I think I, I still have keeping Warriors in seven. Steph was fantastic the other night. Efficient, man. First of all, can they at least call a foul for the guy? Like the man's getting yeah, hit left yeah. and right. He was not, but he was still knocking down shots. Yeah. What was good to see for the Warriors though is that you had Clay come up big. Andrew Wiggins has been Wiggins major this playoff. He's been doing everything, man. Yeah. Between getting buckets, getting a uh, good amount of rebounds, like he's been playing. Draymond's a little bit of a concern. You see Clay starting to make a comeback. But hey, man, the Celtics are a talented team. Defensively, they're on a string. They've been shooting really well. They shot for a yeah. while during that game. They were shooting over 50% from three. Celtics are not going to be easy yet. That's why I still think they're gonna, this is going to be a seven-game series. Yeah. I still, you know, I went Celtics. I said Celtics in seven. Um, I'm still leaning that way, but I felt like this game is going to hurt them because I don't see them winning at all tomorrow night. I don't think they stand a chance. I think Golden State is going to go crazy. And then, you know, now they're on the ropes. You know, can they can they bounce back in Boston and then come back to San Francisco in Game Seven? I mean, once it gets to seven, it's anybody's game. But I, I thought the Chef's performance uh, Friday night could have been a series breaker, and I was impressed with the way Golden State closed them out defensively down that stretch, man. The final four minutes, I mean, all Boston could do was just launch up threes. It was like Marcus Smart, two threes, Brown, Tatum. They weren't letting him get any type of dribble penetration. I thought Clay's defense on Jalen Brown oh my was God. solid. Um, Golden State really tightened up and gave credit to Steve Kerr because he wasn't afraid to go offense, defense with, with Draymond from like the three minute mark. You know, he was finding his ways to swap in Draymond and Jordan Poole and um, as you said, Wiggins, you know, nice to see Wiggins really kind of um, taking form here, you know, after his career kind of got off to a slow start. Seems like he's settling in. He's, he came up big for them. I think he had double digit boards and Kevin. points. I think Looney's been uh, very Kevin impressive. Kevin Looney, thank you. Yeah. Because Yo, he's been, honestly, him over Draymond, that's the tough point. That's yeah. a tough decision Kerr's got to make is going yeah. with Kevin Looney over Draymond. He's grabbing he better boards. boards than Draymond. That's the thing, grabbing better boards. He need the boards. That's also, like not seen too is the fact that Looney's done a really good job with three quarter closeouts, three quarter ball denials, mm -hmm. like little things like that. Not necessarily letting the time lord, you know, get yeah. into the paint and do that. You know, wreak havoc. Not even offensively, but just he's letting guys avoid getting blocks. So that type of stuff does a big, 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 big job with giving them an advantage. But Steve Kerr is really good at adjustments and. You know, they they need to they need to tighten up for sure. The Celtics do yeah. for limiting the mistakes because right the turnovers, man, sloppy, important. sloppy, bro. That's showing of a young team. The yeah, showing of a young team. Yeah, that that killer instinct, man. So so Dave, who who are you going with? Uh, who do you think takes the chip, man? Two two series tied up. I mean, I had Celtics winning in seven, uh, but the last game kind of caused me. <laughs> that's his, his, that's, that's, what, that's what I'm saying, <laughs> man. That's what I'm Cause, saying. Because Steph doesn't, Steph doesn't need to have a game like that again. You know, right. all they need is Clay to just wake up for one game. And, right. You know, he's done that so far. Events can just follow suit, man. That's kind of that's kind of scary. Yeah. So. Clay's and Clay's done that this 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 playoff run. Like he's at least given one game per round where he just has waken up. Goes so in. just gotta wait for Clay. Yeah, gonna be interesting, man. But uh, once again, great show, everybody, and uh, people in the chat. So to the replay, gang. Leave us a comment after this, man. Uh, if, if David does come back, leave us the prospects that you want to talk about. And, you know, we'll talk about a fresh slate for you guys as we creep up on the draft. Uh, remember that this show is presented in an audio podcast format as well. So no need to miss it, even if you miss it on video. And uh, Manscaped, this show is presented by Manscaped. So go to manscaped.com and the promo code KFTV for 20% off plus free shipping. We'll catch up with you guys next week. Great show once again. We out of here. Peace.